right, just a quick reminder of the considerations before we get in. Does the player show a lack of attention and consideration when making his challenge? Does the player act without precaution? Does the player make fair or unfair contact with the opponent after touching the ball? Does the player act with complete disregard of the danger to his opponent? Does the player act with a complete disregard of the consequences for the opponent? Does the player have a chance of playing the ball in a fair manner? Is the challenge putting an opponent in a dangerous situation? And does the player touch the ball after making contact with the opponent? These are all things just as a reminder so that as we get into discussions of, of um, upper body challenges, we can recall back to what it is we want to be thinking about for these decisions. So I'm going to skip through these things because these are not uh, things we need to look at because we already looked at them. So upper body fouls. So, the, so a couple of key things to think about, remember, et cetera, when we're making decisions. The first is, is the ball in playing distance when contact is made? Um, you'll remember that from the discussion we had uh, about a lower body foul of, foul with Tobin Heath in an NWSL game a couple of weeks ago when we talked about it. Uh, the factor of is the ball in playing distance when contact is made is actually really important when we talk about upper body challenges uh, because we're going to see some clips where we, uh, we need to discern if the contact between the opponent and the, uh, the challenger is fair or not in relation to when the ball uh, is, is close by. Is contact made when in the act of playing the ball? Uh, this is an important distinction to make. Are they trying to play the ball or are they going out of their way uh, to, to play the opponent, if you will? I hate that phrase, but I'll use it. Um, are they going out of their way to not play the ball to create contact with the opponent? Where on the opponent is contact made? Obviously, we hear a lot of discussion about shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder contact, uh, and that's where we'll focus our energy. Is the contact happening on the side of the opponent, which we typically consider to be fair, or is it happening in the front of the opponent or in the back of the opponent? And a lot of these decisions we're talking about, uh, the side of the shoulder versus the back of the shoulder blade, both are part of the shoulder, but are very completely different uh, co points of contact and results uh, from contact. So things we need to be thinking about uh, when doing that. Last is, is contact made in a fair or unfair manner? Obviously, that, that takes a little bit of discretion to know what's fair and unfair, but it's easy to, to sort of think about that when looking at a decision and trying to decide if we want to call a foul. So we're going to look at a couple of these things and uh, dive right into just some, some decision making. So here we go. So. If you blink, you'll miss it, but so if we freeze frame at the moment of truth, you can see obviously the player has his back to the defender. The ball is not in playing distance because there's a body between the defender and the player. And so he pushes both arms, middle of the back, and the result, of course, is that the player falls forward. Um, that's obviously a very simple one, but it's one to sort of get us off on what we're looking for. So uh, again, we need to be looking at, does the player have the ability to play the ball fairly here because of where the ball is brought down by the attacker? The answer there is no, he can't fairly play the ball and instead makes contact with the back of the opponent unfairly, pushes him in the back, pushes him to ground. So an easy one to get us going, but you get the frame of reference for what we're talking about. So here we have a little bit more subtle foul. Make sure everybody sees it. We're gonna watch this guy right here with the headpiece on. Right before the ball gets there, he reaches out, pushes player in the back with both hands. Creates space for himself to then win a ball that otherwise would have not been very easy for him to win. So you can see right there, player's got his back. Both of them have the opportunity to play the ball. And well before the ball is in playing distance, the player pushes his hands out 
creates space for himself unfairly and heads the ball. So this is the first decision we're looking at where the ball in playing distance really becomes a factor. Um, if the two of them, the ball is there and it's both in playing distance and there's contact between the two, we need to be a little bit more discerning. But on this one, in addition to just being very unfair contact because he pushes him in the back, um, the fact that the ball is nowhere near him, right there is where he pushes. You can see the ball here. He's obviously creating unfair contact there to move the player out of the way so that he can go and head the ball. And obviously the result or the impact is he heads it down to his teammate, puts the ball in the back of the net. So it's very important that we catch those fouls because they're small, they're quick, but they are unfair. And they create an advantage for an opponent in an unfair manner. So we need to make sure that we catch that. So again, ball and playing distance here is the thing we really want to be focused on when he pushes him out of the way. And we'll counter that with... Oops, I did not use that one there. So again, here we go. We're gonna wait for the replay on this one because that's where we actually see what happens. So again, this is a subtle one to pick up and it's hard, but we have to watch carefully for it. Um, players running with the ball, he has his body between the ball and the opponent. The opponent comes up and makes not a lot of contact, but contact definitely into his back, sort of on his side. So we often hear side to side is okay, shoulder to shoulder is okay. This is not shoulder to shoulder contact because A, for them to be shoulder to shoulder, they need to be next to each other. This is not next to each other. This is a ball. This player is in front of this player, he carrying the ball at his feet. This player hits him with the elbow forearm area into the side, the back, this area here, while still running, nudges him to ground. The important thing to recognize in this, and I'm gonna play it at a fast speed, is when players are running really fast, particularly really good athletes, it doesn't take a lot of contact to make them go to ground, particularly when they're running really fast. Um, putting somebody off balance while they're in mid-stride, nudging somebody while they're in mid-stride can very easily cause someone to lose their balance and go to ground. So even though it doesn't look like a lot of contact, this is where we have to be discerning in the kind of contact that it is, which is here, it's in the middle of the back, it's at a pace uh, that's very high, and he doesn't really have the opportunity to play the ball, and so he nudges him to try to get him off balance. So let's watch this again in full speed to see really how fast they are running and how little contact it actually takes to put him to ground. So again, right there, doesn't play the ball, reaches for it, misses, and instead, you can see the arm here towards the back of the body, definitely not shoulder to shoulder, which you can tell by the way the player falls. If it's truly shoulder to shoulder contact, a player will go to the side. This player goes down forward, which means he took some contact in the rear of his body. So this is one of those opportunities we can use the, the result of the challenge to help us in the decision making. If the player falls to the side, Maybe there was shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder contact. Maybe there wasn't a foul. Here the player dumps forward, which would seem to indicate that there was uh, contact from behind him, force applied from behind him, and therefore probably unfair. And again, remember, it doesn't have to be a lot of force when players are, are moving this quickly. So we need to be very discerning about that. I'll go ahead and stop now. Any questions on a couple of these that we've looked at? Uh, looks like we do have one from uh, Mike Stokes. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Just for my information, was there a call? Doesn't matter. The correct decision would have been, regardless of what the referee did, the correct decision would have been to blow the whistle and call a foul. 
Any other questions? So I'll repeat what, uh, what I, we talked about last time when we talked about clip analysis. Um, it's less important what the referee did in the game that we're looking at. Uh, this game happened last season, so it really doesn't matter what the referee did. What we want to do is use clips from games that we can learn from and make decisions about what we should do moving forward, not necessarily focusing on what the referee did do in this game, because it's, it's irrelevant at the end of the day. Any other questions before we move forward to some next clips? All right. Whoops. Play that one again. So this is one of these decisions now where your gut may tell you this is a foul. And the important thing that we need to now discern with this one is who actually has the ability to play this ball. So as this play develops, Brasso in red here, the number 21 in red, takes a touch that goes out in front of the defender. And the defender catches up to her. So at this point, these two players are side by side. Arguably, the blue player is actually a little bit ahead, and the ball is directly in front of the blue player. The blue player is much closer to this ball than the red player is. And so the blue player is in possession of the ball, or at least in clear playing distance of the ball, and the red player tries to throw her body or try to tuck her body into the blue player to try to win possession of the ball. Right before the contact happens, you can clearly see the blue player is definitely the player in position to play this ball. And so the red player trying to win position again, stretches herself forward to try to get her body. You can see the red player leaning to try to get her body in while the blue player clearly wins position and holds it. This contact right here is shoulder to shoulder. If the red player doesn't lean forward to try to get her body in front, this is normal shoulder to shoulder contact the blue player dribbles the ball away, no problem. Because the red player tries to force her body in to get in position is why the contact happens a little bit on the, the back of the shoulder, but really this is shoulder to shoulder contact. You can tell because the players are side to side. At this moment, if their hips had come together, their hips would touch side to side, no problem whatsoever. Because the red player leans forward, it's not quite the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder contact that it would have been had the red player kept a normal position here. So even though it looks like the blue player maybe pushes her to ground, the red player is stumbling forward because of the position that she takes. Now the last thing to look at closely is does the blue player actually exert pressure with the arm to push the player down? Because it looks like the player falls as a result of a push, but if you watch the blue player's arm, she doesn't actually push her. She puts her arm out to create a barrier and never pushes, just keeps their arm out. For there to be a push, for the way Rasso went down, this hand would have needed to be behind Rasso in the back. Instead, this player's hand is actually in front of Rasso. So the player couldn't possibly push her because her hand's out in front of her. So at this moment, her hand is in front, not behind can't push, therefore the force going to ground for Rasso was created by herself, not this, not this defender. So this would be a scenario where we don't want a foul called. And in fact, if you'd watch this game live, you'd see Rasso got up and ran away immediately, not expecting a foul. So this is a play again where it might look like a push, but we have to be very careful with what we're discerning here and what we're looking for. What is the body position as this play develops? The two players are side by side. The blue player, who is a faster player, at this moment, exactly side by side. This is perfectly legal. If 15 decides to push her arm out to the side, perfectly legal to do that because that's the side of the body, no problem. It's not holding, it's not pushing, it's just extending arms out to the side, creating space, perfectly legal. So at this moment in time, the blue player is perfectly legal in what she's doing, and it's a result of Rasso trying to squeeze her body in that she puts herself off balance, goes to ground. She goes to ground not as a result of anything the blue player has done. 
and the fact that the blue player was leaning a little bit is what causes her to stumble and maybe put her arm out for balance has no impact on Rasso going to the ground. So therefore, we don't have a foul called. Any questions on that analysis of that play? So again, feel free to raise your hand or type into the Q&A section. Anybody disagree with that analysis? Okay, then we'll move on. So we're looking at this aerial challenge right there. So this is a play where, again, the proximity of the ball becomes a factor that we need to think about. As the ball is coming up and being challenged for and ultimately headed, the green player does make contact with the back of the white player. There is some contact. It's not much but you can see it causes the white player to sort of lean forward a little bit as a result of the contact. The question we need to ask ourselves in this moment is, where is the ball when the contact is made and is it in playing distance? So I want you to think about this play versus the play we saw in the penalty area where the player with the headpiece pushes the player forward before the ball gets there. Contrast these two different plays in your head and ask yourself, is this a normal, the one we're looking at now, is this normal contact between players as the ball is headed, or is this unfair contact created before the ball is headed? And if you ask yourself that question, if you watch this replay, you'll know that the ball is headed at about the same time that the player makes contact with the back of the opponent, which thus makes it legal contact. So the player jumps up, wins the ball, and as the wins the ball, makes a small amount of contact into the back of the opponent, but in the course of, of playing the ball fairly. So the ball is fairly played. The contact to the back happens as a result of the player backpedaling and standing while this player heads the ball. So this is not unfair contact. Even though there's contact in the back, it's done very minimally and in the act of playing the ball legally. So that's a discerning factor that we need to be thinking about when thinking about aerial challenges. Does the contact come as the ball is being played? And if so, does it have an impact, or excuse me, does it impact the ability of the opponent to fairly play the ball? You can see here that because the contact happens as the ball is being played and not before the ball is being played, that the ability of the white player to fairly play the ball is not impeded. He jumps up to play it. They come together as the ball is played. The white player had just as much opportunity as the green player to win this ball. There's no contact beforehand that makes that unfair. And there's very, very inconsequential contact after the ball is played. Nothing to be considered to be unfair. Any questions on that clip? OK. Another clip for us. So the same clip we saw the last clip, we have to ask ourselves, where was the contact? When did it happen? Was the ball in playing distance? And was unfair contact made that kept made it impossible for the player to fairly play the ball? Who wants to answer this one for us? Anybody want to provide an analysis for us on this clip? Nobody? Any volunteers got, want, to, want to provide? We got Mike Stotes. Mike, take us through it. The lone man tonight. Okay. <laughs> okay. Looks like his number is 52. Came up well in advance of the ball coming down. So he came from behind and knocked the player down, eliminating his chance for playing the ball. So you think this is fair or unfair contact? Unfair. So you would call a foul here? Sure, because you'll notice that the black player does not leave the ground. 
and instead does what? Knocks the white player down. Perfect. So there's about the same amount of contact here as there was on the last clip that we saw. But the important thing, as Mike has noted here, is the contact happens before the ball gets there. And so the push in the back that happens, happens well before it gets there. It happens right there. And the ball's still up here. Mm -hmm. And that contact to the back forces the player to lurch forward, duck down, and creates unfair space for the player who's going to head the ball. So even though the contact is about the same amount of contact as we saw in the last clip, the key difference here is it happens well before the ball gets there and it impacts the ability of the opponent to fairly play the ball. So Mike, excellent analysis. We should be calling a foul here primarily because it happens while the ball's not yet in playing distance. Anybody disagree with that evaluation? <laughs> well done. All right. Thanks, Mike. My pleasure.